Jesus' name. Amen. All right, now, last, gosh, it's been, well, before Christmas. Uh, it's been a few weeks, and the last time uh, we looked at the book of Judges, we saw how Israel is spiritually barren with no spiritual life towards God at all. They have sunk so far into their idolatries that they don't care about what God wants. All they care about is what they want. They have plunged so far into sin that they don't even recognize their need to be delivered from it. <laughs> they have plunged so far that they don't even acknowledge their sin of forsaking God, nor are they crying out in their misery because of their sin. Israel has grown so accustomed to their servitude that they're content to stay in that condition. So God has to act apart for them to deliver them. And the question that we asked last time was this, how in the world can God save a people who don't want to be saved? <laughs> Answer, he raises up Samson. He raises up a deliverer who is so strong that he begins to deliver Israel despite Israel. A deliverer so strong that he doesn't need Israel's help at all. He does it all by himself without Israel doing anything. But what is so interesting about the story of Samson is that God doesn't just raise him up to be a deliverer for people who don't want to be delivered. Samson is going to serve as a mirror to Israel. You see, Samson's lust for women is Israel's lust for idols. Samson is going to reflect the true spiritual condition of Israel. So, so this sermon is going to be more about Israel's sin than it is Samson's deliverance, which is meant to prepare us for next week. <laughs> so buckle up, because this is a steamy, sexy soap opera episode. It has mixed with childish animal house pranks and the violence of Gladiator. And I'm going to have you remain seated. I'm going to read a, a big chunk of it, and then I'm going to elaborate on the last but we are going to cover both chapters 14 and 15. Give your attention to the reading of God's word. Samson went down to Timnah, and at Timnah he saw one of the daughters of the Philistines. And there he came up and he told his father and mother, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. The literal is so that I may bed with her. Okay? But his father and his mother said to him, Is there not... A woman among the daughters of your relatives or among all our people that you must go take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? But Samson said to his father, get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. His father and mother did not know that it was from the Lord, for he was seeking an opportunity against the Philistines, because at that time the Philistines ruled over Israel. Then Samson went down with his father and mother to Timnah, and they came to the vineyards of Timnah, and behold, stop, look, whoo, surprise, <laughs> a young lion comes towards him, roaring, and then the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and although he had nothing in his hand, he tore the lion to pieces as one tears a young goat. Now, I, okay. Has anybody, have you ever seen anybody tear a goat apart? let alone a lion? Holy cow. But apparently that's like an analogy of their day. I don't know. <laughs> All right, anyway, so he tears this young lion apart like a young goat, but he did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. And the reason why is because now the lion's unclean. It's dead. And then he went down and he talked with the woman. And again, further emphasis, she was right in Samson's eyes. Now, after some days, he returned to take her. And he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion, and behold, there was a swarm of bees in the body of the lion and honey. And he scraped it into his hands, and he went on eating as he went. And he came to his father and mother, and he gave them some to eat, and they ate. But he did not tell them that he had scraped the honey from the carcass of the lion. Why? Because it's an unclean animal. And he just made his parents unclean. His father went down to the woman and Samson prepared a feast there for the, the young men used to do. Now, it's, this is a custom of the Philistines, not the Jews. So this wedding feast is a celebration of the Philistine custom, not of the Jewish custom. 
So there's a lot of alcohol here. And then as soon as the people saw him, they brought 30 companions to be with him. And Samson said to them, let me now put a riddle to you. If you can tell me what it is within seven days of the feast and find it out, then I will give you 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes. But if you cannot tell me what it is, then you shall give me 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes. And they said to him, put, put your riddle that we may hear it. And he said to them, out of the eater came something to eat. Out of the strong came something sweet. And in three days, they could not solve the riddle. So on the fourth day, they said to Samson's wife, entice your husband to tell us what the riddle is, lest we burn you and your father's house with fire. Have you invited us here to impoverish us? And then Samson's wife wept over him and said, you only hate me. You don't love me. You put a riddle to my people and you have not told me what it is. And then he said to her, behold, I have not told my father nor my mother and I shall tell you. She wept before him the seven days that was in which the feast lasted. And on the seventh day, he told her because she pressed him hard. And then she told the riddle to her people. And the men of the city said to him on the seventh day before the sun went down, what is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? And he said to them, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have found out my riddle. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. and He went down to Ashkelon, which is a Philistine city. Not a Jewish city. And he struck down 30 men of the town, took their spoil, gave the garments to those who told the riddle. And then in hot anger, he went back to his father's house. And Samson's wife was given to his companion who had been his best man. Now, after some days at the time of the wheat harvest, Samson went out to visit his wife with a young goat. And he said, I'll go into my wife in the chamber. But her father would not let him go in. And her father said, I really thought that you had utterly hated her, so I gave her to your companion. Is not the younger sister more beautiful than she? Please take her instead. And Samson said to them, This time I shall be innocent in regard to the Philistines when I do them harm. So Samson went, he caught 300 foxes, took torches, and then he turned them tail to tail and put a torch between each pair of tails. And when he had set fire to the torches, he let the foxes go into the standing grain of the Philistines and set fire to the stacks of grain and the standing grain as well as the olive orchards. And then the Philistine says, who has done this? And they said, Samson, the son-in-law of, Timnite, t son -in -law of Timnite, and he has taken his wife and given her to his companion. And the Philistines came up and burned her and her father with fire. And Samson said to them, if if this is what you do, I swear I will be avenged, and after then I will quit. And he struck them. And ours says hip and thigh, but it says he struck them with a blow that was unsparing. He wiped them all out. And then what ends up happening is, because he does this, the Philistines come out looking for him. They gather together. And then they come to the Israelites and request where Samson is. And Israel is like, Samson, what are you doing? Don't you know that they rule over us? Why are you causing all this trouble? So they go to hand Samson over to the Philistines. They don't want to be delivered. And so what does God do? God strengthens Samson. He breaks the binds and he slaughters. And look at verse 16 of chapter 15 because our translations miss it. He literally says, with the jawbone of an ass, I have piled them in a mass. He killed a thousand Philistines. This is the word of the Lord. <laughs> okay. Yes, and there's a lot that goes on. But here's what I want us to think about before we start. Think about the flow of judges, okay? It all starts with Israel's failure to drive out, and we're calling them the ites, right? There's the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, and on and on. We're calling them the ites. They failed to drive them out. They did not obey, obey the voice of the Lord, and instead they formed a friendship with the ites. And what did their friendship with the ites lead to? It led to the ites enslaving Israel. And so the first deliverer that God raises up is a colorless deliverer named Othniel, right? He's the ideal deliverer. He was a family man who trusts God and is empowered by his Holy Spirit. But then after Othnia, with each judge, we see not only Israel getting worse and worse and worse, but the judges get worse and worse and worse. You remember the scandalous savior, Ehud, the left-handed man? 
and then the courageous Deborah, and then the coward Gideon, who started off well in his weakness, but then lived as if he was king, which then led to his evil son, Abimelech, who grasped for greatness and then burned everything down. And then to the sad and tragic story of Jephthah, who was unwilling to sacrifice himself and sacrificed his daughter instead. And now we come to Samson, who is probably the most flawed of of all the characters in the book. And this is absolutely amazing, because again, last time, chapter 13, we had this announcement of a miraculous birth. So this birth is going to be, this baby is set apart to be a special child, a set-apart Savior who is going to fulfill the Nazarite vow of holiness. So wouldn't you expect that this deliverer would be different than everybody else? Wouldn't you expect this Savior to be more godly than everybody else? I mean, you would expect a moral Joseph here, wouldn't you? Or a a meek Moses type of deliverer, maybe, with a birth announcement like that. But instead, we get Samson. (laughs) We get an impulsive, emotionally immature, violent, sexually addicted, selfish man who lacks self-control. Look at chapter 14, 1 to 3 to see how it all starts. This is a classic when Tarzan met Jane scene, if you haven't figured that out. (laughs) right? Samson sees woman. Samson wants woman. Get woman for me. I want to bed her. I mean, golly, do you see how difficult we make dating today? I mean, if we only followed the biblical model of Samson here, wouldn't it? (laughs) Wouldn't that just eliminate a lot of the uh, hassle of dating here? Oh my gosh. But the only problem is, is that she's not an Israelite. She's a daughter of their enemy. She's a Philistine. This is why Samson's parents respond in verse 3, is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives or among our people that you must go and take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? I want to give one quick comment here. This is not against interracial marriage. This is against interfaith marriage. Okay? Okay? She is an uncircumcised Philistine. Her people are outside of God's covenant. She has no relationship to God. Paul in the New Testament would say this is being unequally yoked. Okay? So think about this. To marry someone who doesn't know or worship Yahweh, what does that tell us about Samson's understanding of God? He doesn't care what God thinks. It doesn't matter to him that she doesn't worship God. He impulsively only cares about what he wants, which means what? This is not love. This is lust. This is not, I want to enter into a lifelong covenant with you for the rest of my life. I am going to promise to live for your good. No, this is, you look pleasing to me, and I'm going to use you for my good. So isn't Samson mirroring Israel here? Israel has drifted so far from God that they don't even think about God. They don't even care about God. They have assimilated so much into the Philistine culture that they are no longer distinct from the Philistines, which means... At this point in the book of Judges, Israel's on the verge of becoming spiritually extinct. You see, in the past, they used to cry out. They used to groan to God and cry out for him to deliver them. But now they're no longer crying out to be delivered. They don't think about God. They don't care about God. They've adapted the beliefs and the values of their enemies so much so that now they're living like their enemies And this raises a question, doesn't it? How do we know today when the church is on the verge of becoming spiritually extinct? 
How do we know when the culture has not just crept into the church, but has actually influenced and overtaken the church? Answer, when we have assimilated so much with the culture that we care more about what is right in our eyes than we do what is right in God's eyes. You see, seeing is a big deal in this text, isn't it? <laughs> in verses 1 through 3, the emphasis is on what Samson saw. Samson sees an irresistible beauty. But I want you to look at verse 3 to see the lens through which he sees her. <laughs> she is right in my eyes means when he sees her, what does he conclude? I need her. I must have her. She will fill me. She will satisfy me. She will give me life. And can we just stop and evaluate this for a moment? Because do you see how sin works? It not only deceives us into thinking that it can give us what God can't. It not only deceives us into thinking that it can fulfill us, it can satisfy us, it can meet our needs, it can give us life, but it also seeks to take legitimate desire for good things and make them epic. Make it ultimate where we feel like we have to have it. I'm going to die without it. You see, why couldn't Samson just say, hey, Mom, Dad, I saw this beautiful woman, and I want to get to know her and see where it leads. Oh, that's great, son. Why couldn't he just see her and acknowledge she's beautiful and then move on with life? Why does he have to? Now, answer, because she's right in my eyes. See, there's nothing wrong with beautiful women, right? I'm married to one. There's nothing wrong with sex, and there's nothing wrong with marriage. So what's wrong with this? See, this is more than just being unequally yoked with someone who doesn't believe in God. It's more than Samson knowing that God has raised him up to be the deliverer from the Philistines. So it would be wrong to marry a Philistine, right? No, what is going on? Samson's desire for this unnamed woman has become epic. It's become the ultimate thing in his life that he has to have. Feels like he can't live without it and nothing else matters but getting what I want. It's epic. It's godlike. He needs her. He must have her. Nothing else matters. She is right in my eyes. But isn't there another lens to look through to determine reality? Isn't there another set of eyes? God's? Right? Remember how the Samson story started in chapter 13, verse 1. And Israel again did what was evil in the what? Sight of God. So Samson is mirroring Israel. Neither care about what's right in God's eyes. They only care about what's right in their own eyes. Israel doesn't care that they've turned away from God and are worshiping and serving false gods. They lust after false gods like Samson lusts after this woman. And do you remember the Nazarite vow that Samson was to live by, right? He couldn't cut his hair. He couldn't touch anything unclean. He couldn't drink alcohol, strong drink, or wine. See, Samson, like Israel, was supposed to be distinct, set apart to be different than all the other nations. They were to be holy. They were not to look or to act like the other nations. Israel was to live differently. 
And what does that look like? They were to reflect God to others. But Samson and Israel, they don't care about what is right in God's eyes. They only care about what's right in their eyes. See, look at verses 5 through 9, right? The lion, when it attacks him, he tears it to pieces like it's a young goat. And then he goes home, and then he comes back, and then, hell, I got to go see that lion I killed. So he goes, and he sees the lion and discovers what? There's bees in there. And what have these bees produced? Honey. So he doesn't care about his Nazarite vow about not touching anything unclean, right? And then what does he do? He eats the honey. Why? Because I have to have it. I have to have it now. And then he gives some to his parents without telling them. So Samson's unclean, and then he just makes his parents unclean. Now look at verse 10. He prepares the feast. And remember, I would put an emphasis on this. It's not in the tradition of the Jews. It's in the tradition of the Philistines. Once again, he doesn't care about his Nazarite vow. He only cares about doing what is right in his own eyes, and he's living more like a Philistine than he is an Israelite. So do you see what happens? By doing what is right in his own eyes, Samson's trusting in himself, and he's rejecting God. By not doing what is right in God's eyes, See, this is how the Bible defines sin, okay? It's rebelling against what God wants in order to pursue what you want. So it's putting your wants, your needs, your desires above what God wants and what God desires. It's making you more important than God. And for those of you who are doing what is right in your own eyes and not what is right in God's eyes, can I just ask you a few questions? Do you know that what you're doing is evil in God's sight? Does it bother you? Are you even convicted? Do you even see it as sin? If you do... I got good news for you. You're not spiritually extinct yet. So cry out to him. Cry out to him to strengthen you against your sin. Cry out to him to change your desires for sin. Cry out to him to deliver you from your sin. But then there are some of you here. You have become so hardened that you're like Samson and Israel. You have no conviction of your sin. None. You won't cry out to God because you don't see that what you're doing is wrong. You don't see anything wrong with what you're doing. So if this is you, can I, can I appeal to our common humanity and give you a perspective to think about for a moment? You see, sin, it's all about self-centeredness. And because it's all about self-centeredness, it has nothing to do with love. Nothing to do with love. When you're stuck on self, you can't love others. You will always use and abuse others to get what you want. When you become consumed with yourself, in other words, it's not only going to lead to your destruction, but it's going to lead you to destroy others. I mean, holy cow, is this not what's happening in this story? <laughs> Look at verses 12 through 20. While at the wedding feast, what does Samson think? Hey, I need a new wardrobe. <laughs> so, and I'm going to get the Philistines to give it to me. So he comes up with this riddle, right? If they solve the riddle in seven days, then he owes them the clothes. If they can't solve it, then he, then he gets the clothes from them. Well, after four days, they can't solve it. So then they pressure his wife. Hey, if you don't tell us, we're going to burn you and your father alive. So then she goes and she pleads with Samson. He refuses until the seventh day. He caves and he tells her. She tells them. They tell the riddle. He gets so outraged he goes to Ascalon and kills 30 men 
takes their clothes and the spoils and then gives it to the guys who solved the riddle. And then what happens? Well, he comes back home, and chapter 14 ends where he finds out that his wife has been given to another man. So in chapter 15, I'm sorry, in chapter 15 is when he finds out. He goes back to see his wife, thinks he's going to sleep with her, and then realizes she's been given to somebody else. And then what does he do? He does what any of us would do, right? <laughs> You'd gather 300 foxes with big bushy tails, tie them all together, put torches in between them, light them on fire, and send them off in the fields where they burn everything up. Needless to say, the Philistines are a little hacked off at losing their crops, right? So what do they do? They find Samson's wife and her father, and they burn them alive. And then Samson responds by striking them with a cruel and unsparing slaughter. And then word gets out to the Philistines, word gets out to the Israelites, they all gather, try to get Samson. His own people bind him and hand him over to God's enemies. And then he breaks the bonds. And then with the jawbone of an ass, I have piled them in a mass, killing a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of an unclean animal. What in the world is going on? Everybody in this story is doing what is right in their own eyes. Everybody in this story is stuck on self. Nobody cares about anybody else. Nobody loves anybody else. Everyone is only looking out for themselves. Samson's no different than the Philistines. He's acting just like them. And here's the thing. <laughs> when what is right in my eyes is different than what's right in your eyes, what is this going to lead to? Chaos. Absolute chaos where we act more like animals rather than human beings made in the image of God. We bite and devour one another for our own selfish gain and survival. Israel's no different than the uncircumcised Philistines. They have become so much like them that they are on the verge of becoming spiritually extinct. Samson, in other words, is mirroring the path of destruction that Israel is on unless God does something about it. And what God does about it is the most amazing thing in our text. But I got to warn you, it's going to sound contradictory, but it's not, okay? Look at chapter 14, verse 4. Right after Samson stubbornly refuses to receive his parents' instructions, and says, get her for me, for she is right in my own eyes. The writer gives us the interpretive lens to understand the story. <laughs> and what is that? Samson's parents didn't know that this was from the Lord. What? For the Lord was seeking an opportunity against the Philistines. Why? Because the Philistines ruled over Israel at this time. <laughs> I guess we're all like, what? How in the world can this be from the Lord? Answer, because God works through sin. He doesn't stand back disgusted at our sin refusing to get close to us in our sin. He doesn't wait until we clean ourselves up first before he uses us. He doesn't wait for us to move towards him before he moves towards us. God enters into our sin and he uses it for his purposes. And like I said, this seems like a contradiction, but let's look at the facts of the story so far, okay? Everyone in this story is acting out of their own sinful heart. God is not making anybody do what they do against their will. Everybody is doing what they want. Everyone is responsible for what they want, desire, and do here. 
But secondly, God's working through their sin to accomplish his redemptive purposes. And we'll look at what those redemptive purposes are in a moment, but think about what in the world is this showing us. Nothing can stop God's purposes. Not even your sins. God is sovereign over your sin. God's grace, in other words, it's always greater than your sin. So what are his redemptive purposes for Israel here? Well, Israel has so assimilated into the Philistine culture that they are no longer living as the people of God. They're living like the Philistines, and God is going to break this alliance. But this is what's so fascinating, because this is an ancient and old alliance, isn't it? This goes all the way back to the garden, when Adam and Eve sinned and formed an unholy alliance with the serpent. They listened to the voice of the serpent, not the voice of God. So they align themselves with the serpent and not with God. And what what, what did God say to the serpent? In Genesis 3.15, he promised, I'm going to break this unholy alliance. How? I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. What is enmity? Conflict. I'm going to create conflict between you and make it uncomfortable. In other words, what is God doing? He's graciously promising to break up our friendship with sin. How? By creating conflict with it. See, God is using Samson and his sin to break up Israel's friendship with the Philistines. Israel does not want to be delivered from their sin, so God uses Samson to create conflict. (laughs) And again, hear me, Samson is responsible here, right? He is responsible for his epic desires and actions. He's responsible for his lust. He's responsible for his selfishness. He's responsible for his lack of self-control. He's responsible for his violence. But God's working through it to accomplish his redemptive purposes for Samson and for Israel. Or, if I could say it this way, I would quote Barbara Duguid from her book, Extravagant Grace. God uses what he hates to accomplish what he loves. God hates sin, but he uses it to accomplish his redemptive purposes. He uses it to cause us to grow more and more in our understanding of his grace. He uses it to cause us to be in conflict with our sin so that we don't stay comfortable with our sin. He uses it to humble us, to make us more dependent on him. And we're going to clearly see this next week in what happens with Samson, okay? But for right now, what's happening? God is using Samson and his sin to create conflict with the Philistines in order to free Israel from the Philistines. See how comforting this is. Our text is wanting us to see that God is at work in every aspect of our lives. God is at work even in our sin and the mess it creates. He's at work even in your unfaithfulness. He's at work even in your doubts. He's at work in your pain. He's at work in your suffering. He's at work in your uncertainties. He's at work when you don't think he is. When you can't see him at work, when you think he's forsaken you, Samson shows us, but he has not forgotten you. See, man, we have this mistaken idea 
that God is at work only when I'm doing well. <laughs> right? Oh, man, I have my quiet time. It was a great day today. Well, of course it was. Or we tend to think that, oh, if I don't pray about it, then he's not going to be working in it. See, we mistakenly think that God is only at work when I obey him. When I live a godly life. When I have the right beliefs and the right behaviors. But Samson blows that out of the water, doesn't he? In Samson's lust for Philistine women, God is at work. <laughs> when the lion attacks, what happens? God's spirit rushes upon him and gives him superhuman strength. When he selfishly takes revenge, how does he kill 30 men? The spirit of the Lord comes about. Upon him in power. And then when the people bind Samson to hand him over to the Philistines, what happens? The Spirit of the Lord comes upon him in power. So God is using a sinful, ungodly, flawed man to accomplish his purposes. <laughs> I don't know about you, but this is very assuring and comforting for me. Because I know my own sin. I feel inadequate and at times absolutely unqualified to be a pastor. Why in the world would God use somebody like me? How in the world can God use somebody like me? Answer, because he's a God of grace and mercy. He's not confined to a box. He's not limited to only using good people. See, if he was, then what would that make us? It would make him dependent on us rather than the other way around. But because he's a God of grace, he can use sinful people. Newsflash, those are the only kind of people God has to work with, <laughs> right? Now, I want you to hear me. In no way does our text excuse sin, and in no way is it saying sin's not that big of a deal. It is a big deal. But our sin is not greater than the God of grace. And I got to end. What is this meant to do to us? <clears throat> First and foremost, it's meant to comfort us and to assure us that our sin does not disqualify us from being used by God. It should assure us that God is at work in every aspect of our lives, even in our sin. It should comfort and assure us that God's not done with us. God will do whatever is necessary to draw us and bring us back to him. And then secondly, it should make us honestly face and deal with our sin. Don't run from your sin. Stop hiding and pretending that it's not there. Face it. Deal honestly with it. Go to God with it. Acknowledge it to him. Confess it to him. Ask him to forgive you. But here it is. Could you imagine? Could you imagine if this church, Redeemer Presbyterian Church, could you imagine if we dealt honestly with sin? Could you imagine if we all together agree to take off the mask and stop pretending that our sin struggles are unique to us as individuals and not common to everybody? Could you imagine if we all agree we're all in the same boat? That there's nobody worse or better than anybody else? You know what I think would happen? 
I think Redeemer Presbyterian Church would be distinct from other churches. I think we would look different than other churches. I think we would be attractive to people because we'd be a safe place for sinners. We're together. All of us are learning how to build our messy lives around the gospel of God's grace. Where we all together are learning how to grow in God's grace. Where we would humbly come alongside one another and help bear one another's burdens. Where we would be less judgmental and less condemning of those who struggle with sin. Why? Because we understand other people's sin because we understand our own. In other words, I think it would make us more authentic and not spiritually fake. It would make us deal honestly and redemptively with conflict when we have it. Or I could say it this way. It would make us a hospital for the broken. It would make us a rehabilitation center for healing and hope for others. It would make us a gym for strength and service. I don't know, Andy. We're going to end this way. When we do what is right in our own eyes, Hasn't judges been showing us that what is right in God's eyes is to be gracious to sinful people? Hasn't judges been showing us that no matter how far we fall into sin, God's grace is so great that it can reach us, that it can rescue us and cause us to return back to God? So sinner, come home. Come home to the God of grace who has made you right in his eyes through his son Jesus. Amen. Let me end 